All right, Geraint, we've had a few questions and uh, we love to dig into these. Sorry if we don't get back to you quickly enough in the comments section. We love making a video about these. So let me just start uh, with a couple of these. I'll throw them at you and we'll see how we get going. So here's a question from, uh, from our recent video about why won't scientists answer my emails. Someone uh, with their own theory wants to throw these questions at us to see whether we can answer them. So the questions are, uh, how did all of the mass get to the center of the Big Bang? Where are the edges of the universe? It must have edges and a side. Otherwise, mass would be way out at infinity. Uh, how long would that it take that mass to get to the center? That would be an infinite amount of time, right? Okay, so there's a number of points here. Um, the I guess the key there's a key misunderstanding when it comes to Big Bang cosmology, right? Mm -hmm. There's still this picture that people have that the Big Bang was some sort of explosion. It was like a grenade going off in pre-existing space. And uh, so, you know, if you've got an explosion, there's the stuff inside the explosion, then there's the stuff outside the explosion. The Big Bang theory doesn't say that, right? So in the Big Bang, and what I mean here is in the mathematics, Mm -hmm. is that let's take our universe, which we think is spatially flat. We won't worry about curvature at the moment. Is that that universe is actually infinitely large. It, it does go on in infinite, dire uh, infinite distance in, in all directions. Now, there are some subtleties involved here that uh, relativity is a geometric theory, not a topological theory. But let's say the simplest picture is that the universe is infinitely large. Mm -hmm. And it was born infinitely large. So when it wasn't like it was a finite at some point and became infinite, right? That doesn't happen. The universe was born infinitely large. And matter was everywhere spread throughout this infinitely large universe. And if we wanted to try and integrate over all that matter, there would be an infinite amount of it. So we don't have edges. We don't have a center. The universe was born infinite in extent with an infinite amount of matter. We don't see all of that universe because we've only had a finite amount of time to observe it. Um, but we do think that beyond the horizons, the universe goes on forever and ever. So I think one of the, one of the confusions here is that they think that, you know, the Big Bang can't answer these questions. You know, where is the center? Where did everything come from? What's outside the universe? Whereas it's not that the Big Bang struggles with this question. It's that if the Big Bang picture of the universe is correct, there is no center of the universe. That's not a failure to answer a question any no. more than if you think that there's a steady state model of the universe and it's existed forever. If I went, oh, well, how old is the universe on your model? You haven't got an answer for that. Well, no, there just is no age of the universe on your model. But, uh, yeah. It's not a problem. So I think that's a, trying to score a point where there is no point to be scored. Absolutely. Right, next one. Does the fact that neutrinos can undergo these mixing changes you talked about, so where one type of neutrino turns into another, does that prove immediately that they have mass because of special relativity? Here's the argument. A massless particle experiences no time and therefore cannot go undergo, undergo a change that's independent of their environment. And the answer is basically yes. Yeah. Um, so any kind of... Uh, particle that undergoes some sort of interaction must carry a little clock with it. They must mm -hmm. experience time. So when we talk about particles decaying, they've got a half-life, they've got a little clock that's ticking in there. And if you get neutrino mixing where one neutrino changes into another kind of neutrino and back again, that is governed by these internal clocks. And if you, when you write out the formula for neutrino mixing, there is a mass difference term, M1 minus M2. Mm -hmm. if, if, if they had no mass, those terms would be zero. There would be no mixing. So yes, essentially, uh, this tells us straight away that neutrinos must have mass because we see them mix. Good. So here's an interesting comment. We did a video with the title, Why Won't Scientists Answer My Emails, as I said before. And someone said, actually, uh, I write science fiction and I've reached out to, science, to scientists on certain topics before. Most have been quite happy to, at the very least, point me in the right direction. I've had ongoing conversations with more than a few. So I think that's kind of interesting because what we were saying was if you send your super long theory to a scientist, don't expect them to reply. But actually, if people are, who are into science fiction want to ask us something, actually, I'm, I'm quite happy to talk about that, you know, if I've got time. I can't, you know, 
time, time, uh, you know, uh, whether I've got time is another question, but actually talking to someone who's doing science fiction about getting the science right, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm exactly the same. Um, if it's about asking questions around science or what's scientifically possible, practical, et cetera, uh, I think those are great discussions. I think many, many scientists would like to be involved. Yeah, definitely. So this is a question that came up from our video about how uh, the Andromeda galaxy is coming towards us and the, there will be a collision with us at some point in the future. And it was a question, it's a question about where's the dark matter in all of this? So the question is, why is the dark matter between the galaxies overpowering the dark matter on the opposing sides of each galaxy? So I think there's a picture there of, of why, why are these galaxies falling together rather than there's dark matter here? Why aren't they just staying where they are being pulled by that dark matter? Um, and if the answer is that the dark matter is lumpy, doesn't that mean that the dark matter is overpowering the dark energy in lumping together? And if, and if dark matter is stronger than dark energy, aren't we back to the question of why the universe appears to be expanding? A couple of different points in there. Okay, so first ones, let's do Andromeda and the Milky Way. So they're two galaxies and uh, most of their mass is dark matter. And so the Milky Way's dark matter is centered on the Milky Way and the Andromeda's dark matter is centered on Andromeda. And if you've got mass in one place and mass in another place, it will attract. So you get an attraction uh, due to the presence of the dark matter and the other mass um, uh, that galaxies have. The Milky Way and Andromeda, though, uh, they sit inside what's known as the local group of galaxies. Mm -hmm. So there's Andromeda, the Milky Way, M33, and a whole bunch of smaller galaxies. And there is some dark matter spread through the local group. But its density is not as high as the density of mass inside the galaxies themselves. So it does have an effect, but a small effect. And it's the main mass in these two galaxies that pull them together. So the other question was with regards to... Uh, dark matter being stronger than dark energy. Mm -hmm. uh, so why do we think the universe is ex accelerated? I think is the key point. The whole point here is scale, right? So what you've got is that we've got lots of mass in the Milky Way galaxy and in uh, Andromeda, and they are strong enough to pull themselves together and they will collide. And at the moment, our local group of galaxies is falling into the Virgo cluster of galaxies, which is like, sort of like the cluster next door. And that's because there's lots of dark matter inside Virgo and there's mass inside our, our local group. And there's some dark matter in between. And there is some dark energy. But what's going on is that as the universe expands and the, the relative amounts of uh, matter, the overall density of matter is dropping, the density in dark energy is not. Mm -hmm. And what you get is that once you get to large scales, the, the effect of dark energy dominates over dark matter. Mm -hmm. So when you get objects separated by large distances in the universe, then it's the dark energy between them that's sort of pushing these guys apart. But when you get things close together, where you've got a lot of dark matter in one place, the dark matter can win and pull things together. So there's this battle. And in fact, there's a, a, there's a thing called the turnaround radius, essentially, which mm -hmm. is where you get this um, uh, switch between matter dominating the stuff falling together and uh, dark energy dominating and pulling things apart. Good. Next one. From a, the um, video about the cosmic web, if we had a universe with spherical geometry, what would happen if you put your head right in the exact center? Would the front of your head meet the back of your head? So I think what's happened here is they're thinking of a spherical geometry as in the surface of a sphere, right? But then they're adding the middle of the sphere as well, which you and, so do. and then there's a special point at the center. But that's not what's what's going on here. So when we say the universe has spherical geometry, we mean like the three dimensional version of the surface of a sphere. Yes, uh, there's no center. That's correct. Uh, but in in that universe. Uh, if you, can, you have to mess around with the expansion. If you did have a spherical universe, mm -hmm. you would be able to eventually see the back of your head, depending on how the universe is expanding. Um, it, if it's expanding slowly, so there's enough time for light to get all the way around, somewhere off in the distance, you would see the back of your head, and then yeah. beyond that, the back of your head again, and then beyond that, the back of your head again. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's the interesting stuff. 
Uh, and finally, from our most recent video, someone commented, quote, the English guy sounds different this time, end quote. Yeah, that might be because we don't actually have an English guy. Yeah, on no, this. no English guy here, Chad. Yeah, seeing that Luke is uh, Australian, true blue, born and bred, <laughs> and, and I'm actually Welsh. And so I, I try not to sound like English guys anyway. So um, I can't even remember. Did, it, did one of us? I don't think there was anything particularly different last mm. time. I, okay. should, I should say with our first book, A Fortunate Universe, I had the idea, unfortunately a little bit too late, but to put a little, like some sort of asterisk or something anywhere in the text where you claimed that the thing being mentioned was in some way Welsh. Uh, so, for example, there would have been a little asterisk next to Penguin uh, yep. And a little ne asterisk next to Elvis Presley. Uh, not, not that he was Welsh, but there's some sort of connection here. That hang on, explain. hang on, hang on, hang on. Elvis Presley is definitely descended from Welsh people. Yeah, well, uh, how far back before you're officially... Anyway, go on. <laughs> well, in, 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 uh, when West, in West Wales, St Elvis was a, a saint who existed long before the St Elvis in the... Uh, 1960s okay. and 70s and there's the Preseli mountains which uh sound an awful lot like presley right so okay. you know they, there's definitely a link there and penguin 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 it's, uh, welsh uh welsh word pen is head gwyn is white so it's welsh for white head which ah. penguin, which penguins don't have but other <laughs> than that doesn't that that cast a bit of doubt over that theory. Anyway. Uh, apparently, the story goes is that the word penguin was actually transported from uh, the names of northern seabirds when people eventually went to the southern hemisphere. And so there, there was an, a penguin in the north and the name got transported to the south. Right. OK. I should say, if you ever watch the Welsh rugby team, there's a finite set of surnames <laughs> being shared by the Welsh rugby team. I was making a joke about that to someone and just to illustrate it, I actually went to the, the web page of the Welsh rugby team to count how many Lewises there were. And lo and behold, the, the trainer, one of the trainer's name was actually Geraint Lewis. And I laughed a long time. Um, so, but yeah, w Williams, um, I should say, my, my, on my mother's side, her mother's maiden name is, well, we would say Davies, but you would say... No, there's no such name as Davies. It's Davis. Right. They're all Davis. So if you're ever in Kingsgrove, uh, there is a small shop you can find which everyone who goes in there calls it Davies Chocolates. But you would say it's Davis Chocolate. That was started by my great grandfather. So they really should be pronouncing it Davis Chocolates. Is that what you're saying? There, there's, it, there's different spellings, but it's all Davis. Uh, there's different spellings of the names Reese, but they're all Reese. Yep. Uh, uh, we get this all the time. But I should point out this th issue with surnames, okay? So this is because we, we are a colonized country. Uh, right. We didn't used to have surnames. Uh, we used to have the same sort of um, structure as they have in Scotland. You'd be the son of. Okay. Uh, instead of Mac, you would use App. So ah. my name would be Geraint App Myrig because my father's name is Myrig. Uh, an ancient explorer, Myrig, is the one that America is named after, if you want that connection. Okay. Um, uh, so it still exists uh, in some sense because some names... Um, so do you know the name Priest? Yes. No, yes. I went to school with a priest. Yeah. So that is a contraction of Ap Rees, son of Rees. Ah. Yeah. So there's I was going to ask, because there are like McDonald's and McWhatever's, you know, McNamara's around today, but I don't hear app as a... Pritchard? They all just did Pritchard. So they just started, they lost the A and just went with yeah. P. App Richard. App Richard. Son of Richard. Yeah. Ah, very good. Uh, but we all got to get surnames when we uh, became a colonized country. And uh, I think that's part of the reason why there are so few of them. Right. So you... Yeah, so don't refer to either of us as <laughs> it's English. So, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, if you go back far enough, Scottish and Irish over here and he's Welsh. So uh, there's your little Welsh lesson for today. And if you ever want another Welsh lesson, just ask your aunt. He's happy to give it to you at any time. Absolutely.